We are being ageist anytime we make uh, an assumption about someone or a group of people on the basis of how old we think they are. And we all do this all the time. Everyone is ageist. Attitudes towards aging start to form in early childhood. And they tend to be negative because in under, you know, in the West, most of the messages are how awful it's going to be to get old. Midlife is the best season of our lives, but often many of us lack fulfillment in some area of our midlife. It doesn't have to be that way. This podcast is a resource for midlifers to discover ways to find fulfillment in whatever area of life you need it. I'm your host, Bernie Borges. Join me on the Midlife Fulfilled Podcast, a journey to make midlife the most fulfilling season of your life. Hello, my midlife friend. Welcome to episode 84. This is Bernie Borges, your host of the Midlife Fulfilled Podcast. Hey, if you're new to the pod, welcome. Hey, this is another Midlife Maximum episode featuring Ashton Applewhite. As you probably know by now, a Maximum episode is where I interview a subject matter expert on a topic that can inform you or help you in one of the following five areas, career, health, fitness, relationships, or legacy. This Maximum episode with Ashton Applewhite is about legacy. Ashton's legacy focus is on her mission to end ageism. Before I get to my conversation with Ashton Applewhite, I want to give you an update on my virtual happy hour get-together that I'm planning. The date is June 23rd, 2023 at 5 p.m. Eastern. That hasn't changed. And look, I know that this is not a convenient time for many people outside of North America. I get it. But if there's enough interest, I will schedule one that is more convenient for my midlife friends, particularly in the European region where I have some listeners. So if that's you, reach out to me and let me know and I'll put something together. Now, one change is I've expanded the group size to 20 instead of 10 based on feedback. And as I record this, there is still room to RSVP. Now, I'm planning to unveil some plans that I've been working on to get feedback. And speaking of feedback, I heard that 10 is too small a group for feedback. That's why I'm doubling it to 20. Now, I'm also going to allow time for group networking so that each attendee can meet each other and do some virtual networking. Hey, if you can attend live, because I'm not going to be recording this event, RSVP below. But do it soon before the event fills up. Now, it is free. I didn't mention that before. It is free, but there's only 20 virtual spots available. And as of now, there's still room. So just scroll down and RSVP. Okay, let me tell you about Ashton Applewhite. Ashton is an ageism activist. She's been recognized by the New York Times, National Public Radio, The New Yorker, and the American Society on Aging as an expert on ageism. And she's been named as a fellow by the Knight Foundation, the New York Times, Yale Law School, and the Royal Society for the Arts. Aston is the author of This Chair Rocks, a Manifesto Against Ageism. She speaks widely at venues that have ranged from universities and community centers to the Library of Congress and the United Nations. In 2017, Ashton received a standing ovation for her TED Talk at TED 2017. And yes, that is linked up in the show notes below. She's received numerous awards for her work. And she says that the most head-spinning award was being named one of 50 leaders working to transform the world to be a better place to grow older by the UN's Decade of Healthy Aging. The truth is, Ashton has more credentials that I could share. But instead, let's get to my conversation with Ashton Applewhite. Ashton, welcome to the Midlife Fulfilled Podcast. Thank you, Bernie. Good to be here. It's great to have you here. I've been looking forward to our conversation for quite a while. Ashton, I want to begin with your backstory. You have such a wonderful body of work. How did you 
get to where you are? How did you become an activist for ageism? Uh, I got older. <laughs> <laughs> I hit my mid 50s, which was uh, 15 years ago. And I realized that this getting old thing was happening to me. And, uh, you know, I think that's typical. I think I think it's hard to imagine getting older, but I also think there's an awful lot of denial around it. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I was really sort of apprehend, extremely apprehensive about it in this sort of vague, free-floating way. And being a nerdy person, I decided to sort of take the bull by the horns and learn about longevity. And I started reading and researching and interviewing people over 80 and learned within a matter of months, if not weeks, how, you know, everything I thought I knew about what it was like to be pretty darn old was uh, way off base or not nuanced enough or flat out wrong. And that just filled me with this you know, intense curiosity about um, why, why, why did we only hear the negative side of the story? What was going on here? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and it became obvious pretty soon that, you know, bias, prejudice, stereotypes around age and aging was, was the overarching reason. So you talk a lot about ageism. You are characterized and recognized globally as an activist for ageism. Let's put a definition to that, Ashton. Exactly what is ageism? We are being ageist anytime we make uh, an assumption about someone or a group of people on the basis of how old we think they are. And we all do this all the time. Everyone is ageist. Attitudes towards aging start to form in early childhood. And they tend to be negative because in under, you know, in the West, most of the messages are how awful it's going to be to get old, how disastrous to encounter any kind of impairment. It can be a judgment can be you're too young in addition to too old mm -hmm. um, and younger people experience a lot of it. It works both ways, but we live in such a youth obsessed culture that older people bear the brunt. So why do you think it's so acceptable in our society and so prevalent in our society? You, you said a moment ago, everyone is, is ageist. I've seen you say that before. Why is it just so prevalent? Well, you know, all bias, is, is everywhere around us all the time. You know, I think we're all uh, racist too. You know, we are all shaped by a unique lifetime of experiences. And the challenge here, we can't challenge bias unless we're aware of it, right? So I think ageism has always been around in different degrees, in different cultures and in different periods of history. It's never not been there. I think it's more a question of, well, one thing happened is people started living longer everywhere in the world. There are a lot more old people than there used to be. And in the 20th century in the US, age uh, started to be conceived of as a social problem that we could fix or solve, air quotes around that, because aging is not a problem. Aging is moving through life. That's when the, the um, retirement community got invented. That's when social security started to lift you know, millions of older Americans out of poverty. So, it, so we became more age conscious. There were more older people. So those are historical developments. I think ageism has gone less questioned for sure than other forms of prejudice. And as to why I'm not sure, perhaps because it's harder to find the bad guy, the opponent, the, um, you know, with, with racial differences there's the other color the other ethnicity gender there's other genders with age ageism is a prejudice against our own future older selves and that is a more complicated and sort of subtle and more elusive reckoning than these other forms um, of bias and ashton your, your body of work is, is truly amazing uh i've watched several of your speeches on on videos your ted Lucky talk you. <laughs> <laughs> and you've written i believe four books if i'm not mistaken and uh the the one that seems to be the most prominent is uh this chair rocks a manifesto against ageism uh, i'd love to hear from you 
what are you hearing from CEOs and just other members of the C-suite when they hear you talk around the things that you describe and explain and educate us on in your book, This Chair Rocks? Well, I would be like to be hearing a lot more from CEOs. I believe, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives are on the rise. Companies are are well aware now that having diverse teams um, makes companies work better, makes teams work better, makes companies more able to respond to a diverse customer base. But age and age bias is only part of the agenda in a, I, the last heard 8% of corporate DEI initiatives. I bet it's grown a little bit since that you know, statistic floated onto the internet. But if you think of as criteria for diversity, you know, gender, race, a sexual orientation, they all pop up. Um, sometimes, you know, ability, disability is there usually. Uh, age is not there yet. So I would like to hear from more of them about that. And what and my ask to your listeners is that when you are in a business setting, I think many of us have have learned to look around, gee, there's only one woman on the panel. Gee, it's a panel about racism and everyone's white. You know, what's up with that? Or a panel about women's rights and they only have one woman there. No matter what the topic of the panel is, if everyone is the same age, it is not responding to the needs of the community. It's not responding to the people who are gonna use the thing. It's not, you know, it, because, you know, the world is made up of people of all ages. Yeah, yeah, that's an understatement. Ashton, in one of your many videos, you talk about five ways to address age and disability biases in the workplace. And I'm just gonna list those five ways and then I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question to to these five Thank ways. Thank you for not making me remember what they are. I got a I know better broken than that. a little cold sweat there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so the, the five ways are check your own bias, take the neck check, meaning look around, be an ally, the bull looks different, and aging and disability are not problems. You've already alluded to that. So are you encouraged or are you discouraged when you look around the workplace as it relates to those five ways to address age and disability bias. You know, that's a big question. And I also have to confess, I am a self-employed, so I am not dealing with those issues on a daily basis, you know, running around to offices collecting data unofficially. But I, I listen a lot to what is happening in the media, anecdotally from the many people I'm in contact with. And I am encouraged because, there, because I think awareness is growing. Uh, a lot of people during COVID said, oh, oh my God, COVID has made ageism worse. And I don't think it made ageism worse or ableism worse. And ableism is... A, a, Ability, uh, disability, both are to ableism what age is to ageism, just by way of a definition, right? It's discrimination and stereotypes and assumptions on the basis of how we think someone's mind or body works. I don't think it made those prejudices worse. I think it brought age in particular out from the corners and into the middle of the room and exposed the systems that were there all around, all along. Just like I think, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement didn't make racism worse. It made us think about it. It came more to the forefront of our thinking. So I am encouraged by that. And I also am encouraged by all we have learned about how to address different forms of bias. It's all, every form of bias is unique. And the way you each of each person experiences a bias is different. You know, you can be two black people from the same community, but one of you experiences gender bias and another experiences, you know, bias on the basis of appearance, whatever. It is unique to each of us. But what we learn have learned broadly speaking about be confronting bias and becoming aware of it in ourselves and how we replicate it typically unconsciously, those tactics apply to awareness of all different kinds of bias. So even though age bias is the last um, the last to the party, how's that for an, uh, a misguided metaphor about prejudice, but it's the last one to reach towards general public awareness, we are not starting from zero. We are building on the basis of all we have learned about confronting and dismantling bias of all different kinds in all different settings. Okay. 
what what is the cost of ages? I mean, I'm not asking for a number as in a dollar cost, but what is the cost to the workplace or to society as it, we deal with ageism? Incalculable. Uh, I mean, in, in the global economy, trillions. The uh, wonderful uh, scholar named Becca Levy did a study that sh and estimated the annual cost to the U.S. healthcare system of ageism in healthcare alone annual at $37 billion. Hmm. Now, what is the cost when an older person doesn't receive treatment and dies? Good luck putting a number on that, of course. What is the cost when a, a person sends out hundreds of resumes and doesn't get a single response? And, or perhaps uh, she eventually lands one and it's, it's hard for older men, it's worse for older women, it's even harder for older women of color and so on. All these things compound themselves when the interview on which she's pinned all this hope because she's desperate is over the minute she walks in the door or turns on the camera, right? If it's a virtual interview, what what's the cost to that in terms of not being able to pay her rent, uh, of not being able to, you know, feed her kids and the cost to all, even those of us who are, who, you know, are not so economically precarious us, and it is gendered, you know, women are punished for appearing to age and when you live in a culture that where everyone on the billboards you know is 18 and flawless it's hard for all the 18 year olds who aren't flawless which is to say everyone because no one everyone is flawed it's hard if you are that age and do you know look like you're quote unquote supposed to look and as we age especially as women you know there there are these messages that are incredibly corrosive but Thinking on the optimistic side again, think how much we have learned in recent years from the body acceptance movement, from the fat acceptance movement. Like no one is perfect. Comparing ourselves to others is destructive and pernicious. And we have to make our peace with what we are, accept who we are, maybe even embrace who we are because that is the way forward. Everyone ages and everyone experiences ageism. So the human cost is compounded immeasurably in every walk of life. I heard you say everyone is old or future old. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Yeah. Um, funny thing about that. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, yeah. You don't have to think too hard about that. Right. <laughs> mm -mm. And yet we spend an awful lot of energy trying to not think about it. Yeah. That's the irony. No kidding. No kidding. So do, do you feel like you're swimming upstream? Uh, do you feel like you're waving a flag? <laughs> you know, uh, out it's there the waving you know. while swimming. That's hard. Okay. <laughs> That's the tricky part. So I have a special doodad that attaches the flag to my back. You know, a culture change is slow and hard, but it is real. A look at how far we have come in just a few decades about progress on gay rights and trans rights. And there's been a lot of pushback, tremendous pushback on equal rights for women recently. But no one gives up power without a struggle. You don't get pushback unless you're actually starting to threaten the systems in power. So yeah, I'm swimming upstream because we live in a patriarchy, which is a system where men have more power than women do. And we live under capitalism, which uses, which pits different groups of people against each other in order to make money in order to maintain the status quo. So, you know, that that's a formidable um, thing to go up against, but I can see progress all the time. And um, none of that, you know, you can't, you can't be in a hurry in this line of work. And I see many, many um, signs of progress. What about DE&I? Uh, you, you, you mentioned that earlier. Is age becoming more recognized as part of the DE&I movement? I think so. Not fast enough. I was, you know, ranting about that just this morning. Um, I think even progressive people don't yet see that age is, of course, a social justice issue. I think there's a, a trap here, a way of thinking like, gee, I'm already doing everything I can to up my anti-racist game, or I'm spending all my time on, you know, women's rights or you know, literacy for kids, whatever the thing is. And that sets us up to sort of zero sum thinking. And, and I've heard it called the oppression Olympics. You know, my cause is more important than your cause. And I will say that I do think 
racism deserves our special attention because of the hideous way it's embedded in American history. But that said, I think it's really important to understand that when you are working to um, against racism, you are making the world better for older people of color. When you are working against ageism, you are making the world a better place for older people of color and so on in all the infinite variations of that, right? Working on women's rights makes the world better for older women because we make up way more than half of the oldest population, et cetera, et cetera. So when we work against any form of prejudice, we are chipping away at the fear and ignorance that underlie them all. When you learn in a, in a DEI training session, oh crap, I did think that, I did say that. That is, you know, that's the, that's the hardest part of any of this is acknowledging that you too have been brainwashed and you too are part of this system. We all are, no judgment. But that process of awareness that my, um, my, my son's girlfriend called it a no shit, oh shit moment. Like, oh really, that's how, oh, oh yeah, I'm part of that. That it's different, of course, depending on the circumstance, depending on who it happened with, depending on what's at stake. But that sense of awareness is universal to acknowledging internalized bias and we can build that muscle. And it and what we learn in one situation is broadly speaking applicable to another. Or maybe we just become a little more humble and think like, gee, I don't know what this person is up against, but I remember that time that I made an assumption that I'm sorry I did, so I'm gonna listen better this time. That's a huge thing. Every little change ripples outward. You said earlier that you're seeing some progress. Are you seeing progress in any pockets of society? And what I mean by that, Ashton, is maybe it's an industry. Maybe it's a geographic area. Maybe it's, I don't know. I just have you observed that some pockets somewhere, anywhere in the globe, are, are making noticeable progress in your eyes? Well, I can't really speak to the geography because age is such a huge category. Like you mm -hmm. could see it in, you know, healthcare, but you might not see it in the lives of rural women. I mean, I can't speak to that, but I do see much ground for progress. One thing that comes to mind is the emergence, I think, abetted by um, how many people started connecting virtually online during the pandemic of women refusing to become invisible and shuffle off stage, notably in Hollywood, notably in the way menopause, which no one used to talk about menopause because it was associated with aging and the loss of fertility. And under patriarchy, a woman's value is tethered to how young she looks and whether or not she is fertile, right? So the fact that we are now talking about that is a good sign. There are hundreds of groups of older women that have emerged around the globe. And I'm also, I can point to a very specific indicator about why I'm optimistic about progress in my own field, which is a resource called the Old School Anti-Ageism Clearinghouse, oldschool.info. And it is a repository of hundreds of free, carefully vetted resources about what ageism is, what it walks, what it quacks like, what it smells like, and where to, you know, what it looks like in communications, in the workplace, in healthcare, blah, blah, blah. And when I launched it with two colleagues in 2018, we didn't have a campaigns section. And now, just a few years later, really, there are over 30 anti-ageism campaigns, not campaigns for writing better or eating healthier, campaigns to dismantle ageism, around the world. So mm -hmm. I see that as very quantifiable evidence that the movement is underway around the world. And you mentioned earlier, geographically, you don't really have any insights. So that global progress, it's not more prominent in say North America versus Europe, or do you have any insights into that? I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, pe people always want to know if it's better somewhere else and their eyes tend to, you know, go move wistfully eastward towards, you know, 
regions that had perhaps have a tra tradition of ancestor worship or Confucianism, there are absolutely pockets, um, indigenous cultures right here in the United States, uh, where, where older people are held in higher esteem than mainstream American culture. But I think the main variable there is the size of the community and the nature of the community rather than where it is. Where people of all ages live in community, it is obvious that everyone has a role to play and that people are important to each other or not important to each other in ways that have to do with who they are and where they live, right? Not or what they do. And it's very hard to hold on to stereotypes when you are mixing it up with people who don't look like you or who don't share all your experiences, right? So the march of industrialization and global capitalism have fragmented families, have, have caused a lot of people move more. People, you know, if you look at China, which has experienced very rapid industrialization, what you see is a lot of older people and young people being left in the countryside and people in the middle years moving into the city to work. All those trends accelerate isolation. And uh, that is, you know, and that's when when discrimination starts to creep in. So it's more about that. Whereas a little village, you're going to have less of it because everyone has a job to do. Mm -hmm. Ashton, given the demographic of the listener of the Midlife Fulfilled podcast, which uh, tends to over index in their 40s and 50s, a few of us out there in the in the in their 60s as well, uh, many of them are leaders in a business, whether it's a small business or a mid-sized business or a large corporate setting. So maybe as a closing thought, uh, Ashton, um, what would you suggest that people be thinking about on this whole topic of ageism? Well, I would say that uh, some of you, you, the younger ones are still in the trough, The if you know about the U-curve of happiness. Uh, so I would say it gets better, it gets easier. I would urge you to take a look at the Age Equity Alliance, which is a nonprofit that helps organizations ensure that they are operating in an equitable fashion. Uh, and I would say, learn everything you can about aging as it crops up, because it's not that there, there are real things to worry about, about getting older, right? But our fears are so out of proportion to reality. And the more you know, the better it looks, if only because for the sort of reason that our fears are so, you know, so out of proportion, as I mentioned. But the more you know about aging, the more accurate your percep your perceptions of it, the better you feel. And the better you feel psychologically, the less likely you are to have all kinds of health problems. This is a whole nother topic for a whole nother podcast. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be healthy, check your age bias. People who are less ageist live longer, heal quicker, walk faster, are less likely to develop Alzheimer's, even if they have the gene that predisposes them to the disease. And I just was posting today about a new study, most of it done by Becca Levy, whom uh, the research whom I already referenced, that shows that people who have, um, if, if you develop mild cognitive impairment, which is sort of, uh, you know, it's some mild memory problems, people with more positive beliefs about aging recover. I had never heard the word recover in this context. And she mm. is a blue chip scientist than people who equate aging with debility and decline. So if you wanna stay healthy and keep your brain working, check your age bias. And you do that simply by educating yourself. There is no magic pill. There is no Bible. Just learn. Fantastic. Ashton, where can my listener learn more about everything that you have going on in your world? <laughs> what I'm having for dinner, all the rest. Um, I am very easy to find. Um, my main website is called thischairrocks.com. And I have been thinking out loud on this subject for now almost I, uh, over 10 years. So you will see there, it says blog, go to the blog. If you enter Levy or dementia as a search term, you will see all the things I have written about this over the years or you know, enter any term you feel like. You will see a link there 
to my TED Talk, which is a really good 11 minute bit of propaganda if you wanna circulate that to anyone or start a meeting with it. There's also a blog to my Q and A, a link to my Q and A blog, Yo Is This Ageist, which is where people can ask me whether something they've heard or seen or said is ageist. And I actually work really hard on the answers because you know these are complicated questions and these are new ideas to people. Yeah. Uh, and also do, do, do check out Old School, the Old School Anti-Ageism Clearinghouse at oldschool.info. Tons of really good resources on all different formats, all free except the books. You said a moment ago that you've been speaking out loud on all this for 10 years. And oh, out I meant loud, thinking out loud. <laughs> well, but out loud is a good way to frame it up because w <laughs> once I discovered you, I I just dove into your content and you have so much amazing content, including that TED Talk and many other videos as well. And just lots and lots and lots of content on your thank website. You. So thank you so much, Aston. I'm really privileged to, to have you um, on this maximum episode of this midlife fulfilled um, episode and uh again it was a conversation i was looking forward to and i knew that i would enjoy i would enjoy every minute of it and i know that my listener will as well thanks very much bernie it's been a pleasure i want to thank ashton applewhite for sharing her insights and her deep expertise on ageism i don't know about you but my eyes are more open now to the widespread nature of ageism. And I'm more aware now of what ageism is and how I can make my contribution to combat it. Now I'll talk more about this on my takeaway episode on episode 85. Hey, as I reminded you in the introduction, I'm planning a virtual Zoom happy hour get together and you're invited. Now, since this is a Zoom happy hour location, doesn't matter. Well, kind of, sort of. What I mean by that is the date is June 23rd, 2023, but the time is 5 p.m. Eastern. So for some of you, location does matter because of whatever time 5 p.m. Eastern is for you. I get it. And as I said in the introduction, if you're in the European region and you want me to schedule something there, reach out to me and we'll try to get that done. Now, this virtual happy hour is for 20 people only. As I mentioned in the intro, I doubled it from originally 10 to 20, and there's still room at the time of this recording. So if you want to be one of them, jump over to the show notes, either scroll down or scroll right, and tap or click on the link that's called Zoom Happy Hour RSVP. During this event, I'm going to unveil something that I'm working on. I'm excited about it. This is something that's been in the works since pretty much the beginning of the year. And the 20 midlife friends of mine that attend this are going to hear all about it. And I want to get your private feedback before I unveil it to the world. So if you want to attend and network with other midlife friends of the podcast, and you'll probably make a few friends along the way, scroll down and RSVP. Hey, make sure that you're subscribed on your podcast player to get each episode delivered to your listening device, including my midweek takeaway episodes that publish on Wednesday mornings. And if you want to get each guest episode delivered to your inbox through email, just go to the show notes page, find the link to subscribe to my weekly newsletter. My next guest episode features Alexa Bradley Husley on another Midlife Maximum episode. Alexa is a certified acupuncturist. You're going to get a crash course from Alexa on acupuncture and how you can use it to improve your health. You don't want to miss that conversation on episode 86. If you're still with me, my midlife friend, thanks for hanging with me to the end. It means a lot to me. And I want to remind you, as I always do, that if you're 80% fulfilled, you're doing great. I'll connect with you on my midweek episode for my takeaway from this conversation with Aston Applewhite. I'll see you then.